Soma Fam Mali. My name is Kelly. Soda Fam Bam. I was like gonna say Fam Bam and Family at the same time, and I just kind of like ah, kind of like Fam Bamily. Um, my name is Kelly McCoy. I'm the college and young adult pastor. You haven't seen me for a couple weeks because I was been I, I have been I was <laughs> I'm severely jet lagged. That's what I'm. That's where I've been. I've been in Africa. I've been in Africa with uh, America's finest young gentlemen and ladies from Soma. All right, and they're here tonight. And so, uh, basically, uh, Soma with with the leadership of Brian Moorhead, who's here, r right over here. He's our he's our missions pastor at the church, and uh, he led us uh, to Tanzania to share the good news, share the living water with people who physically didn't have good water, and they desperately needed the life giving water that Jesus offers. So, uh, so, so Brian took us with him, and we fearlessly went into the depths of one of the like, like deepest, darkest Islamic villages. And we did our best to share God's love. And uh, tonight is an opportunity where we get to share with you what exactly happened. And so for some of you, you don't know um, what, what, we're do what are we doing in Africa in the, in the first place? And what is this, you know, Tanzania trip? Uh, just, so I, just so you guys know that Rocky Peak has a relationship with a missions organization in Tanzania that is trying to help, you know, these people, these Muslim villages, these Muslim tribes find Jesus. And one of the ways that they're doing that is by... Uh, showing them, well, it was by providing a physical need first. Before we provide for some of their spiritual needs, sometimes we need to help, we need to provide for some of their physical needs first so that we have a door for the gospel to enter in. It's kind of like, you know, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so we are trying to care for these people in Tanzania. And this particular tribe, uh, can I say the, the tribal name? Okay, so it's a deep. Yeah. Okay, so we can't say the tribe name, right? <laughs> so it's an awesome tribe. It's an awesome tribe in Tanzania, and um, they're literally drinking water out of um, the the ground, like the dirt. Like the, it rains, and the water fills up a puddle, and they take their buckets, and they use that for drinking every day. Cooking, drinking, washing, that's the kind of water that they live in. And they know they need, uh, you know, better water because their children are literally dying. Uh, and, they're, and they're getting diseases, and they're contracting malaria, and there's, you know, stagnant water, and it's like affecting their life. And instead of other, the, instead of other relief uh, organizations coming in, we decided as a church to come in and provide relief and also provide Jesus. And so what we decided to do, um, Brian and, you know, let, told me about this trip a while ago, and I was like, yes, let's do this. Let's go ahead and provide water. And so we decided to put this trip together, and we just threw it out there to you guys. You know, I wasn't, I didn't know how many people were going to really respond. You're like, hey, who wants to spend $4,000 to not go on vacation? Um, so... And actually, a lot of you guys responded. So it was like 20 of us responded to, um, you know, give, give like a chunk of their summer to missionary work in Tanzania and spend $4,000 doing it. Uh, not of your own money, but asking other people to support the mission. And, um, and, and not everybody could make it. So out of 20 people, I think we narrowed it down to 15 people that ended up going to Tanzania. And they're, they're sitting amongst you even right now. And some of them are wearing Tanzania shirts. And some of them aren't, like me. I'm not wearing a Tanzania shirt. But uh, I decided that um, we would have, you, have the Tanzania team come up and, and share a little bit about what God did in their lives. Maybe how God transformed them. And maybe how God took the next step in maybe reaching somebody from this village. Now, keep in mind, we were not able to share the name Jesus to these tr villages because it's, a, it's part of a five-year process where we are building a relationship. So the first step was just introducing them to God's word and the God that loves them. That's the first step. And, and we spent 10 days just doing that. 
And then there's going to be other trips. And after a couple years later, there might be somebody else that, that lets them know that they're desperately in need of a Savior. And that's all they may do. Hey, just let them know that they're desperately in need of a Savior. And then maybe a year after that, somebody's going to come in and say, hey, your Savior is not going to be this water. It's not going to be your community, but it's going to be Jesus. And that's when these hearts and these lives are going to be saved. And we're hoping that it's the people that are in the surrounding villages who have been converted that will go in to this particular tribe and share the love of Jesus long after we're gone. And so we were a part of a bigger picture. And so I want to give you an opportunity to, not just to hear from me, but I want you to hear from some of our people. So please help me welcome up one of our missionaries, Joshua Myers. What's up, Jay Myers? Joshua Myers. You know, the funny thing is, is that when I, um, should, should I tell him how, how I recruited you? Like, we were just grabbing coffee one day, and I was headed to uh, a... Ta- late, Two months after we've already recruited everybody. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm going to this Tanzania meeting. Want to come? And you're like, sure. And then he, he sat through the whole meeting, and they're all like, are you going to go to Tanzania? He's like, uh, what are the dates? <laughs> He's like, sure. He's like, all right, cool. You need $4,000 in two weeks. Thanks. Bye. And so that's what happened. Josh, tell us what God did and tell us your story. What is God doing in your life and how does Tanzania fit? Absolutely. Well, first, I just want to say, yeah, that story, I give him like the half is crap answer I've ever given someone in my life when I said, yeah, I'll go to that meeting because I was like... That four thousand dollar like was just a barrier in my like just a huge barrier. But honestly, it did show that God wanted me to go on this trip right away. That even though such a big barrier in front of my eyes, four grand, that it just seemed like God answered every prayer little by little. It seemed almost effortless. Like God was just saying, "Hey, like I want, I want you to go on this." And to just start this off, um, I've never been outside the country. Um, better yet, barely been outside of California um, until this trip. You know. Um, and so I think it was definitely a leap of faith for me because I had, I had no idea, like, what it's like anywhere really barely outside this bubble, you know, that I've been in. And going out there was like, oh, my God, what's going on? But um, honestly, the lesson that I learned it because going out there, um, I, got, I got actually really sick the second day I was there. Um, I um, honestly, yeah, I, I started getting like the stomach, my, my stomach was feeling queasy. I got the sore throat, headache and all these things. Um, and it definitely was like, I felt like the enemy was really trying to get to me, discourage me and just make me feel like, oh, I'm not ready for this week or whatever. And, um, but the amazing thing is that same night, and this is probably honestly my highlight of the trip was that night I ended up, you know, feeling weak. I accidentally slept through dinner because of, (laughs) and I even felt worse um, that night, but I just decided to devote myself to worship that whole night, and um, just sitting, laying in my bed with my earphones in, just worshiping God, and that was honestly my highlight, because it it showed me that even, no matter irrelevant of how I feel, you know, God still wants to use me as a vessel. He still wants to fill me up with the Holy Spirit, and do something amazing that week, and that is exactly what he did that week. And, you know, he gave me just enough energy, just enough passion to get through the next day. But it was more than just getting through the next day. Like when I walked in class and I felt the need to share my story to my class. And my story, I have a lot of, I have a huge medical history. Um, Like long story short, I should have passed when I was 12 years old um, because of some organ issues and whatever. But um, I told I told him the story in detail. Obviously, I don't have time to share you my story, but I told the class my story, and it totally dropped the barriers so fast with my class. And again, these are Muslim leaders, and these are um, village leaders. And again, when they first saw me, I definitely felt some whatever you can say, but they were just staring at me. But as soon as I shared my story, it definitely created common ground right away for them. They're like, wow, okay, so this you know, hardship is something that we all, you know, go, like, go through. And when I shared my hardship, they honestly opened up right away. People were raising hands and ask, asking me if they wanted to share their story. And they, people like started sharing their stories. And that was, that was totally God, just, like, creating common ground, you know, and that, um, something that I could, you know, camp on. And, like, wow, okay, there are no, even though I've been across the world, even though I've been stuck inside this bubble, going out there realizing that there is actually more in common with these people than I thought. And um, 
But honestly, the rest of that week, um, teaching and um, it was just the lesson I learned, um, especially after getting sick that one day, was a deeper meaning of sacrificial, like serving sacrificially. And the reason that is is because um, it's just no matter how we feel, God calls us to serve him. No matter uh, whether you're sad, whether you're happy, whether you're weak or strong, you know, that God wants to use you wherever you're at, you know. And I noticed, yeah, when I worshiped him and gave him everything that night, even though I was feeling totally homesick, um, he definitely showed me victory in that week, how he called me to share my story to those people. And the rest of the week was just straight up showing love and ended up them be wanting, they were just so excited to take us into the village and meet all their whole family. And, and again, like, it didn't seem like people were giving each other hugs in the village, but like in the village, especially when it was like time to leave, when I first saw them, it became so special because they reached and gave me a big hug and said, thank you for everything. And, um, and so I would definitely say as, as a trip that kicks off in ministry, um, this was the best turnout I could have ever expected, you know. And again, I just, I just want to say um, that serving sacrificially, irrelevant of how you guys feel, is extremely important. And, that's, and that just shows where identity or our identity lies, you know, because um, if we serve God because we want to be happy, which he does make us happy, but... If that's the reason, it should be because he is the Alpha Omega, the first, the last, the beginning, the end, and he's worthy to be praised and worshipped. Um, and so just realizing that and giving myself as a vessel for him to just fill me up and just teach his villages with confidence um, just was incredible. And again, I just want to remind you, like Jesus, like, quote unquote, probably wasn't happy when he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, you know, and like dying on the cross, but he still served us sacrificially and irrelevant of how he felt sinners you know like we're we're sinners and he still did that for us and i just feel like how much more should we do that for god a perfect father a god to just let him fill us up and just serve him irrelevant of how we feel so that was the big lesson that god showed me that trip so oh so yeah i <laughs> I would definitely say the verse, so that really sums everything up, is um, Isaiah 6, 8. And again, he actually showed me this verse months ago, um, and it meant so much to me. But uh, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will, I, who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And when God called me, when he asked me to, Hey, do you want to go to Africa? Again, I wasn't sure. I asked God like three times, but when he showed me, that it was him telling me, I was like, okay, Lord, send me. Like, I want to go. And, and I know exactly why I was there. So it was incredible. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it, man. All right. Dude, uh, you can go ahead and take okay, a seat, man. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just admire the fact that uh, Josh did it just, you know, he... His, his story is one of obedience, uh, despite his feelings and emotions. And I just appreciate that, Josh. And I, you know, we all do as well. Uh, the next person I want to bring up is uh, Sam Antha Santos. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's so great to come and um, just share this night with you guys and be able to share just the story of what um, God did in Tanzania, um, and it, it was such a blessing to be able to go to work with our father. Um, so, uh, when I was thinking about what to share with you guys, it was, um, honestly very difficult for me to put into words just, um, how much the Lord did. Um, and so I guess I'll start with how I felt. Um, I did not feel ready to go back to Tanzania. Um, actually, when we were in LAX, um, I just felt really scared um, and very fearful of um, just being sent again to this place that I felt like, you know, the Lord changed me, um, you know, the, the previous year. And, and I had so many expectations that I had built up for this trip of, you know, seeing the nationals that I met there last time or feeling like maybe I'm not going to be used as much this time or, um, I don't know, just... Uh, the thought of going with my peers was absolutely terrifying um, for some reason. And so 
Um, I was sitting in LAX with my carry-on bag and all these expectations, you know, made it feel like I was carrying around like a hundred tons of weight on my back. And so I decided in that moment instead to um, be honest with um, a couple of my team members and take a walk around the terminal. And so um, as I was walking, I, I turned to some of the girls and I was like, you know what, honestly, I am terrified right now. I don't want to go to Africa. I don't want to be sent. And it was crazy to see just how much I felt that in that moment. Um, I didn't want to go back because I was just so scared of um, just a bunch of different things. And um, at that moment, I, I didn't realize, you know, how much we were going to be able to, to do and, and be welcomed into and um, how much of a privilege it would be to go back. Um, and so as you, as you know, we, um, uh, a couple of weeks before we were on the ground in Tanzania, um, a lot of the religious leaders in the area and um, some government officials and our E3 partners in Tanzania met um, to kind of just uh, allow us access into this village and teach water hygiene. Um, it, I don't know if you realize this yet, but a Christian group going in to teach uh, a Muslim village water hygiene is not normal, and it's, it shouldn't be allowed. Um, and so, you know, that, that, um, that day that they met, our uh, E3 leader, Keith, um, he had received a word from the Lord, and that word was love. And um, there was a man at that meeting who was... Um, basically the religious leader for all of this uh, larger metropolitan area in Tanzania, this um, basically bigger city that we were uh, just meeting a village in. Um, and he was the head shay of this entire region. And if there was anybody, a shay is, um, I, I can't explain it other than he is a religious, a Muslim religious leader and he's higher than, kind of a pastor, more of like a, like, a, an, executive like an executive pastor, <laughs> um, and a bishop, yeah, just a really high up guy, and if there was anybody to be swayed at this meeting, it would be this guy, and so um, Keith goes in and he speaks about love, and this word that falls on this entire group of powerful men, um, it doesn't miss this man's heart. Instead, it opens it. And he gets up and he says, you know, the, these people are here to bring love. And um, <laughs> he was like, all we can do is hate each other, but these people are here to bring love um, and to share love. And with that, we were allowed, before we even knew it, to come and share water hygiene with these people. And you know, something that I realized as we were um, going through the training each day, um, we weren't allowed to say the name of Jesus. We weren't allowed to talk about the Holy Spirit. We weren't allowed to, you know, share um, the gospel with these people. And something that God really showed me is that you don't need to share the gospel to love somebody. You don't need to take them out of their entire life situation and, you know, pray away all of their sin and, and take them out of everything that they know to be able to really love them and meet them where they, where they're at. And so, um, that, that was really challenging, you know, coming in as a team of American college students to come and, and, you know, we're really fired up because these people, you know, they, they don't believe what we believe and they're religious leaders. And wouldn't it be so amazing if they all accepted Christ? And, you know, we're so excited to share this and, you know, God just very patiently says no and it's okay. You can do what, what I'm asking you to do because this is my will, you know? And so, it was just such a special moment. And, and you know, I realized as I'm sitting here with this, this small group of men and I'm, I'm looking at this um, imam in my group and I'm just sharing a water hygiene tip, you know, like wash your bucket and your rope before you put it in your well so that you don't contaminate the water. And um, I'm just looking at him and I'm smiling. And every time I smile at him, he smiles back. And I realized that, you know, the, these people are human beings. They, they're not without 
those human wants and needs that we have. Um, and so when you smile at them and you feel joy, it's not hard for them to see that. And it's not hard for them to realize that that's, that's what you have inside of you. And, and though you're not saying this is the joy that I find in Christ, it, it's not hard for them to realize because they were created by the same Father. And so this was the verse that I had, light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart and good news gives health to the bones. And um, it takes faith to believe um, that these people who are deeply embedded in this religious system um, will receive that joy and will receive that good news and receive um, that health for their bones. But, um, you know, I, I can believe it because, of, um, because I know who my father is. And so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank Samantha one more time. Well done. Well done. Oh. It, really, it really is amazing what can happen if you smile at somebody. Like, it's so, like communication is like 80% nonverbal. So I, that's such a beautiful picture of what you painted. Samantha Santos. Awesome job. Um, dang. <laughs> Such a good word. I'm going to treasure that or just watch the YouTube again. Um, uh, I had the privilege of, of, you know, each group had a partner. So each person had like somebody that they would go and teach a classroom full of, you know, Muslim leaders that were going to go out and teach this water lesson to other um like Muslim households. And, you know, we were teaching water, but in the middle of our water lesson, we would stop and we would, and we would talk about the creation story because that's what we do have in common with our Islamic friends. And so we would teach the creation story from God's word and we would do that in these classrooms and everybody had um, a partner. And so this next person I want to bring up was my partner in Tanzania. So Madison Hernandez. <laughs> Tell us what God did. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I prayed a lot about this, um, and it's really scary to sit up in front of 100 people and talk about, like, what you learned in a foreign country on a mission trip because I spent a lot of time laying on my bed, like, processing it and staring at the ceiling and thinking about how much I didn't understand it myself. Um, but I came down to one thing, and I think that the biggest thing that God taught me is that he is alive, um, and he's working every single day in our lives. Uh, he's not distant, and that's something that's really hard for me to understand. I, um, I spent a lot of time before this trip picturing God, um, as a really distant father, um, someone that I had to impress, someone that I had to please. But I was also so afraid of spending time with him and searching for him and being hungry for him because I was terrified that I wouldn't find anything. I didn't want to ask for guidance. I didn't want to ask for direction or um, anything really because I was afraid that I wouldn't get it and that this God that I had spent all this time um, putting my faith in just like wouldn't be there. Um, and God showed up in so many miraculous ways in Tanzania. Um, the fact that I got to be friends with these Muslim leaders, like be their friend. Like they were, <laughs> like that I miss them, you know? <laughs> like it's so hard to describe. When I, I went to a trip to Uganda with Brian um, about a year and a half, two years ago, and I left and... It's not that I didn't love that place, but I just loved it in a different way. Um, I left and it was like Uganda stayed there and I was here. And now it's like, like Tanzania is here. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, so I don't know. I just, to be their friend and to get to love these people so um, genuinely was just a miracle. Um, and I think that I spent a little bit too much time waiting for God to show up in these miracles, like waiting for God to show up in these ways where 100% of the Muslim leaders in this village voted that we could be there. 
um, and share love with, or share our love with them. Um, I wasn't searching for God in the everyday. Uh, and being home and searching for God in the everyday, and, you know, 45 minutes before being here, um, sitting on my bed and just feeling God say, like, you need to close your laptop and stop watching The Office and spend time with me. Like, I know that you're afraid to share. I know that you're afraid to share with 100 people your story, but you, like, I'm here. Like, we're going to figure it out. Um, and I was reading Daniel all day. Um, well, it took me all day. And I... <laughs> And um, I, I got to this one part where um, Daniel, I forgot his name, Daniel, uh, <laughs> Daniel's about to be, like, sent into the fire. Um, and King Nebuchadnezzar is, is telling him, like, you need to bow down to this idol that I've created or um, you're going to burn. Um, and Daniel just says, something along the lines, I don't have it memorized, and I don't have a verse up there, um, but it was like, I'm not going to bow down to your idol, my God is going to deliver me, but even if he doesn't, I'm still not going to worship your idol, and that part that where he says, but even if he doesn't, just really stuck out to me, um, I feel like now I have the strength to, to say, like, I can, I have the faith that God is going to show up every single day and, and that he's going to show that he is faithful to me. Um, but even if he doesn't show up in the way that I expect or exactly in the timing that I want, he's still going to be there. So even if he doesn't show up in the way that you want or you expect, um, he's still going to be there. Um, always rooting for us, always rooting for me and you. Um, and so... I'm just so grateful that I get to love a God like that, and I don't know. I, I learned a lot on this Tanzania trip, and I wish I could share more with you, but um, that was the biggest part for me, so thanks for listening. So awesome. That's my partner, Maddie, son. All right. Madison, I'm so proud of you. Good job. Um, the next person, I'm, I'm so proud of her, too. It was like one of her first opportunities leaving the country also. Uh, I, she is literally Soma homegrown. Like, the first time she stepped, like, the first time I was introduced to, to Diani was, like, at a, at a luau a year ago. And then she started serving faithfully. And then she started being a team captain. And she just was in life groups. And she's just, just really beloved Soma leader here. And I got a chance to go to Tanzania with her and I got to see her leadership in action and I was so impressed by her. Please help me welcome up Diani. Where are you at? Come on, come on, come on, come on. How intimidating. <laughs> Hello, hello. Um, so yeah, definitely what Kelly said. It was my first time ever leaving the country. Um, I was like, oh, I have to get a passport. How expensive is that? How expensive is that? Yeah. And then the shots, oh. <laughs> Just one was $200. I was like, that's a lot of money. I don't got that much money. Um, but I, just even in the beginning of just the whole process of just watching the video and, you know, God telling me, that's where you're going to go. I was like, okay. All right. <laughs> and there's just like, just, just that part. Just, okay, now you got to raise $4,000. Well, I don't even have $4,000, so what a, who am I going to ask? And, um, and he just kept providing for me. And he was like, just, just trust in me. Just give me control. I was like, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> Control freak. And <laughs> really, though, and he was just like, just, just give it to me, and you'll go. You know, and, and it was a really hard process, and just really hard-headed, just, all right, God, I'll give it to you. And, you know, he provided. 
every step of the way, even when I was like, okay, I don't have $200 to get this shot, but I need this shot. Okay. And he, you know, he did it. And so, you know, I, I bought all this stuff and I was like, okay, I got to get a neck pillow. I got to, you know, that part was exciting, you know, because, you know, um, <laughs> it's just like, okay. But, you know, and after that ex extremely long plane flight that I'm like, I'm a professional now and I've only left the country once. <laughs> Get ready for my YouTube video of tips and tricks. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, Sam was actually my partner. And I was like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? Just me being a control freak again, just, just worrying about what am I going to do? How am I going to, what is my purpose here? Because everyone was like, oh, I know what I'm going to do there. I know I'm called there. I know exactly what I'm there for, and I'm just like, yeah, I have no idea, other than just God telling me to go. And so I was like, okay, so I'm gonna let Sam lead because Sam's done this before. And then we get there, and they're like, yeah, this is completely new. And I was like, <laughs> great. <laughs> None of us know what we're doing. <laughs> um, but it was just God, just God leading us. And um, our imam was, which is um, the Muslim religious leader for our village. And from the moment I met him, there was something just sur uh, surrounding him, just a light, just, I just saw something. And I was like, Sam, um, do you see that? Or is this just me? Or am I crazy? And um, she was like, uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't see it, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, so I am crazy. It's probably the malaria pills. And um, and I was like, what what is you know what is this? What am I seeing? And what it was is God showing me you know that even though He's the religious leader for that village for you know in the Muslim religion, but He's going to be that leader for them when they when when they become Christian. And I saw it. I saw Him. You know how enthusiastic He was. Says. I, I can see him, maybe not now, maybe within the five years, maybe even later than that, just him praising the Lord with all of his might and just to see that joy, that's what I saw. And um, it, it's just crazy to see, like, God's love 24-7. Like, you know, we live, we, you know, we're able to freely love him every single day, every second here. But how much, you know, do we... You know, do we really do that? You know, let's be real. We're, we're, we're home. We're, we're able to be distracted easily in office and, you know, Netflix and Hulu and, you know, all that, all that stuff. So, you know, being there and, and to, like, just sit on, on a bus for an hour, you know, being, you know, being in Africa, and it's just like, whoa, I'm in Africa. I'm in Tanzania. And it's just like, I didn't get here by myself. I didn't, there was no way I could have done it. That was God. And, and to see, you know, his, 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 the world that he created, it's just like, whoa. And to see the love. The people who don't even know him. You know, seeing, seeing them on the first day being that hope, that hopeless set of people until, you know, Saturday when we went to their villages and you could just see the, just see God's love. And it's like, you know, that's something that he showed me. His, his love is everywhere, even in the unreachable places, even when I don't think that, that, it, that it's there. And um, I actually have a verse. Um, it's not going to be up there because it was kind of last minute. Kelly was like, so you do you have a verse? And I was like, uh, okay, I do now. <laughs> um, but it's actually some, uh, a verse that, you know, spending all that time not having Netflix and stuff like that, just like really allows you to like spend time with God and not be distracted, you know? Um, so it's uh, Jeremiah 6, 12. 
And it says, their houses will be turned over to others, together with their fields and their wives, when I stretch out my hand against those who live in the land, declares the Lord. And when he first showed me that, I was like, um, what? Am I reading the right version of this? And of course, the Wi-Fi, well, there was no Wi-Fi, so ESV was all I had. And I was like, okay. <laughs> You know, please, Lord, give me some Wi-Fi for NIV, please. <laughs> and <laughs> and um and I was like, okay, and I was like, okay, I got it, I got NIV, and I still had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, okay, so, and I shared with um a few of my my friends, Amanda, and I was like, so um, and Audrey, who's not here. And uh, I was like, so do you guys know what this means? Because I don't. You guys are thoroughly, you guys thoroughly read more than I do. And they're like, well, that's like, you know, them in the future. And I was like, oh, yes, that is them. That makes sense. That is why I see, you know, that light on the imam. That, that, that's a, a verse of them, you know, of what their future is going to be like. You know, at the moment, they're a Muslim village, but... Soon they're going to be uh, um, villages um, for God and, and to glorify his kingdom and to spread it even more um, fear, uh, just fearlessly and so passionately. Um, and so that was, that was my verse, like this whole trip. He told me like multiple times. I was like, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, but it was honestly just amazing to see just the love and how accepting they were. You know, we, we're, we're saying, and all of us have said, it's a Muslim village, it's a Muslim village. Guys, Sam and I are female. We're girls, okay? All of our, all of our, the, our whole group was men. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> you know, we're not, Sam and I, we're not supposed to be teaching men. We're supposed to be teaching women. And the fact that they, you know, allowed us to teach them, allowed us to share the word. Maybe not like Jesus, yes, Jesus, and, you know, the Holy Spirit, and, you know, we couldn't even say Jews. Um, juice. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, but, you know, it's just like, <laughs> am I going too much? Is it too far? <laughs> Tell me when to stop. No. <laughs> no. Um, you know, we're, we weren't supposed to do that. That's not in their culture. That's not in their religion. You know, a man's supposed to teach a man, and a woman is supposed to teach a woman. And that's what it was originally. And so I was like, oh, snap. So I'm teaching men? Okay. And I was a little scared. I was, to be honest, I was quite, quite scared. What, what, would they, what would they do? You know, and, you know, God was just like, I got you. And they accepted Sam and I with open arms. I mean, the first day, they're like, come to our village. I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe later. <laughs> um, and we, we, did we did visit the village later. <laughs> In groups. So we we're cool. We we're cool. And, um, and they were so close to where we were teaching them walking distance it was just and and to see like they're always you guys are making me giggle <laughs> losing focus and, and um you know just to see their their village it was it was simple but you can see the love there and it's not like whatever love it's not superficial it was god's love and they didn't even know it yet you know i think that was another thing that was amazing it was like we're you know god gave us it's the seeds, and you know we're we're planting it, and we're giving them physical water, and we're giving them the spiritual water, and we get to see, um, you know, to be, you know, plowed and dug in and covered, whatever the whole process of farming is, and um, <laughs> you know, and to see it like watered little little by little every day, and so excited to see what you know God has in store for them for the next you know, five years. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much, Diani. Don't you just love her? I, I freaking love you. Oh, man. I freaking love you. I freaking love you. Oh, man. Well, those are, I mean, those are four of the people. I mean, we had 15 people from our team show up. So there's more stories like that. Just ask anybody that's wearing a Tanzania shirt or, you know, or just ask Paul. Uh, and <laughs> so... Or oh, oh, Warner, wherever you're at. Yeah, so um, just God moved. God moved. God moved. And, and uh, it was, for me, the craziest thing was I got to see what God can do through you, right? That you're not a project to be worked on, but you are a partner to be worked with. And I got to see what God can do through you. Uh, every morning while I was in Tanzania, or maybe it was a jet lag, but I just took advantage of it. I was waking up at like 4.35 every morning, and I would just go to the uh, cafe downstairs. And by cafe, we're not talking Starbucks. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a rickety table that was like sideways. I would <laughs> type on my laptop. Um, but I'll be praying for what God was going to do that day. And that was some of the most rich time in my life in my life, in my spiritual journey. And like every morning I had a word. I'm like, gosh, I, I, I haven't preached in two weeks. So anybody who talks to me, they're about to get a sermon. Like, <laughs> they're going to get like, uh, it's like, ask me a question, somebody. <laughs> uh, I was checking the Google Voice for the Soma hotline. Anybody? <laughs> we got a 36-hour plane ride. I'm like reading all these commentaries. And I'm just like, just don't open this can because it'll just explode. Um, so, and so, but I would spend time with Jesus every morning and, um, and just in a different way though, just preparing, um, you know, the, the curriculum and, and praying for the villages and pr really praying for, for our, our Soma team. And, um, one of the things that I, came to my mind, um, one of the biggest questions that came to my mind was why on earth would God want to work with me? I think that's highly inefficient for God, completely. Um, have, it really is. I am so, like, not a good partner. If, the, if this was, like, a, you know, uh, you know, ever had, a, like, a group homework project, right? I'm the, guy, I'm the guy that you don't want in your group homework project because you will do all the work, and I will take the credit. And, uh, um, but I grew out of that stage, uh, hopefully. Um, but... But when it comes to group projects with Jesus, he will do all the work. And it looks like sometimes I take all the credit. And, and I'm like, why on earth would God want to work with me? I'm just going to make things more difficult for him. Has anybody ever done like a father, like, like bring your child to work day, but you were the child and went to work with your parents? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Great. A few of you guys, right? That's probably one of the most inefficient work days for your parents. All right. I'm just telling you that because not only do they have to worry about their job, they're thinking about you and making sure that you don't mess things up. And, or, or not just mess things up, but they want to, you know, develop a relationship with you while, you know, doing legal work or whatever, right? It's those type of activities, bring your child to work day. Like the only reason why an organization would do that is not because of productivity. It's because they know they want their, their employees to develop relationships with their families, right? So relationships over inefficiency seems to be a clear value for God. That, that if God was going to use me, he's clearly not interested in efficiency. He's way more interested in relationships. And so um, there was a verse that, that I'm like, well, what exactly is this work that God wants me to do with him? And I guess I'll do that. And um, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is that job description. And, and, and it answers the question, why on earth would God want to work with you? And the first thing we see is the reason why God would want to invite you to work with him is so that you can recognize his authority. So that you can recognize that he's the boss, 
right? It says right there, Matthew 28, 18, if you have your notes, open it up right now. Uh, open it, you know, turn on your Bibles um, or whatever. But definitely you want to take down some notes because the, we want to answer this question whenever you ever feel like, how could God use me or why would God use me? Well, I'm about to tell you the answer. And maybe you don't need to know the answer now, but you might need to know the answer later. And the first thing that you need to know, the reason why God wants you to work with him, he wants to invite you to his work so that you can recognize his authority, not just in your life, but in everyone's life. It says, Jesus saying this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, which literally means he's the Simon in Simon Says, right? Like, he says, you go, right? He's the one with the authority, and unfortunately, it's not you. He's got authority in heaven, and he's got authority on earth. Guess who does not have authority on earth? Us. But for some reason, we think we do. We think we're the ones who call the shots. That's right, Bella. Mm -mm. That's right. Out of the mouth of babes. Right, we think we're the ones calling the shots, but Jesus says here, hey, 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 disciples, all 11 of you guys, because the 12th one, you know, kicked the bucket. All 11 of you guys, you need to know. Too soon, huh? You need to know that I'm the one with the authority. I'm the boss. I'm Simon. Does that make sense? And the reason why God would want you to like come to daddy-daughter work day or, you know, father-son work day is so that you know like, oh man, my dad, he's a big deal. People listen to him. And whether or not I accept his authority, he's still in charge. So why does God want to use you? Because he wants you to recognize his authority. The second reason he wants to use you is so that you can recognize your purpose. He says, all authority has been given to me, both in heaven and on earth. Now that you know who's the boss, I got a job for you. Your purpose on this earth is to go. Make disciples of all the nations, teaching them what I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You got a job. It says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations. And you know what disciples means? Of course, it means learner, follower. We're not talking about making fans. We're not talking about making subscribers. We're talking about making disciples of all the nations, of all the nations. God's plan for humanity is to make disciples through disciples. God's plan for humanity is to make disciples through disciples. Your job as a disciple is to make more disciples, learners, studiers. People are following you as you follow Jesus. That's your job description. That's what God is doing on this earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son. You got to think about, and this is a big job. Again, if this is God's job description on this earth, huh, he's going to have to carry the, carry the weight because I'm highly inefficient. It reminds me of a, of a father who... Uh, <laughs> who like every week would mow the lawn because he's a good, he's a good dad. He's a really good husband if he mows the lawn. Like for me, I'm, I would call somebody. We would have, you know, gardeners, no problem. You know, it it'd literally be like one of my interns. It would be Curtis like every week. <laughs> Curtis, Curtis, there's a Chris 20 waiting for you. <laughs> like literally... But this guy, however, is a good father, and um, he's mowing his own lawn. And um, he's got a kid, he's maybe like five or seven or whatever. <laughs> well, you used to be five or seven. <laughs> and he watches dad every week mow the lawn, and so he, you know, he hears the engine going, and he sees dad like going out there making crisp, nice lines, very nice crisp lines. You know what I'm talking about, like the lines? You know, the really straight lines, right? And, and like the kids like at the window looking out. He just really, he like, part of him wants to go out there help dad. And she's like, oh man. Um, so he's like, 
he wants, he wants, he wants to partner with his dad. And dad notices, and, and, and he opens the sliding door, and he's like, Dad, can I, can I mow the lawn with you, right? And, it, and usually, like, that's super cool at, like, five or seven, and they just pray that that desire to help doesn't go away, which usually happens at eight. Um, <laughs> but at seven, they really want to help because they've never seen this before, and they want to experience a different level of, of engagement with dad. So, so dad, you know, lets, lets, the, lets the son you know, puts his little tiny hands on the inside of the lawnmower handle. And then dad puts his hands on the outside of the lawnmower handle. It makes him think that the kid is pushing the lawnmower, but really it's the power that the dad is displaying, is pushing, doing all the heavy lifting for the kid. Right? And even though the lines may not be as straight as he normally would like them to be, there might be spots or whatever, but the dad is doing all the heavy lifting, protecting the child from any danger. And why on earth would the dad want the child to partner with him? It's got to be for relationship. Relationship over efficiency. And it's the father's joy to partner with the child, and it's the child's joy to partner with the father. It's all about relationships. Because I'm like, why on earth would God want to use me? Why? I mean, he's got access to people that are far more qualified. He's got access to angels. He's got access to prophets. Like, why? <laughs> why do you want to use me? Well, because he's definitely not concerned about efficiency. He's definitely more concerned about relationships. And it starts with me recognizing his authority. And here's the reality. Whether you recognize his authority or not, he's still the boss. It's just a matter of time until you get to the point where you recognize that too. And you may not know your purpose, but you do now. Go. Be what you were called to be. You're not a project to be worked on, but you are a partner to be worked with as God does the heavy lifting and develops a relationship with you. And lastly, compensation. The prize is his presence. See, what if your dad asked you to work with him and he said, hey, congratulations, I'm just going to hang out with you. That's your, that's your compensation. All right, we'll do it again tomorrow. All right, see you. Good night. Right? Like, that would be, like, a ridiculous compensation. I'd be like, Dad, I got bills. <laughs> like, I got a mouth to feed. <laughs> like, I got friends to make. I got gas to put in my car. But the reality is, is that God says, hey, you know, this is your job. This is your purpose on earth. Make disciples, teaching them everything I taught you. Everything. And here's the thing. You may not know everything, but you teach what you know, and you go. That worked out really well. <laughs> but you do. And your compensation, your, his, prize is, his presence is, is the prize. And the thing is, is that I know that Jesus is talking to 11 of his best friends on earth who just watched him suffer and die for the sins that they did. They just watched, I know, they just watched Jesus. <laughs> they just watched Jesus die three days ago. And then Jesus shows up saying, hey, I'm the boss. This is your job. And guess what? I won't leave you. And for somebody who's ever lost anybody, that means a lot more than you may consider. On this trip, I was having um, these dreams where I... Um, where I was seeing like, like my dad, like what, 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 what my dad would be doing right now. And by the way, my dad died last year. And um, before he died, I actually didn't spend a whole lot of time with him. We had a very difficult relationship. Uh, we, like I really didn't like him, and I had to forgive him for a lot of bad things that he did to me and my mom. But at the end of his life, like I really re reached out to, to, to share God's love with him. And now that he's dead... 
I would move mountains to see him again. I would move mountains just to, to be in his presence one more time, just to tell him I love him and just to know that he's around. See, and I can imagine what the disciples are thinking here where their best friend died and said, hey, the prize for your life is my presence. What I have to offer you is not necessarily money, not necessarily a wife, not necessarily a family, not necessarily an animal, a dog, or a future, or whatever, which I can offer you all those things. But the most important thing that I have to offer you is me. And surely I will be with you always. And that word in the Greek for always is every single moment and every single day. To the very end of the age, Jesus promises you that. Because he's far more concerned about a relationship with you than he is about accomplishing perfection in this world. Or accomplishing perfection in your life. So why does God want to use you? Simply for a relationship. It's the Father's joy to partner with you. Is it your joy to partner with the Father? We're going to invite the band up. And um, I, there's, a, there's a three questions that I want to ask you. You might want to write them down or just consider them. The first one is, why does God want to use me? It's not because you're qualified. It's because he wants to be close to you. It's not because you're qualified, but he wants to be close to you. So why does God want to use you? It's not because you're qualified. It's because God wants to be close to you. Second question is, or a second statement, I just, it's not a question, is that God doesn't see you as a project to be worked on, but a partner to be worked with. God does not see you as a project to be worked on, but a partner to be worked with. And last, will you join God? Will you join him for no other reason than to experience his presence? Will you join God's mission to make disciples? To serve sacrificially for no other reason not to make friends, not to be popular, not to be accepted, but to simply enjoy his presence because we are the most like Jesus when we serve and love one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you offer us your, yourself and there's nothing else that we can ask for more there's no other reason to serve and love you than you. That you are the greatest accomplishment that we can ever even seek to imagine on this earth. That being close to you and experiencing your presence is by far greater than anything that we can possibly think or ask or imagine. That your love and your presence is greater than life itself. That we can go three days without food three weeks without water, but we know that without you, Jesus, we're already dead. So we thank you for this life that you give us even right now, and we choose to live it with you, serving and loving one another, because it is our joy to partner with you, and we know it is your joy to partner with us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We give you this time. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Go ahead and stand up.